see everyone. Um, and I'm really excited uh, to be part of this uh, particular panel. And I think um, you will really also be inspired by the time you leave today by the stories that you're going to hear. And what we um, basically what we're going to do is go th um, have an opportunity to interview. I'll be interviewing, and John, um, between the two of us, will be interviewing and talking with the panelists about their experiences of uh, being advocates and rep and representing the needs and concerns of people with lived experience. And uh, with that, I'm going to. Uh, go ahead and start. Um, and after, let me just say, after we go through the uh, process, we will, um, uh, or after we finish the interviewing, then we will have an opportunity for uh, questions from the audience. So, so if you can hold questions, uh, that would be great. Just take a note as you as something uh, comes to your mind. So, um, as a way of introducing our panelists, I have. I uh, asked each one of them uh, to talk a little bit about um, who they are and um, what their experience has been in terms of being a uh, person with lived experience who's involved in advocacy, public policy work, and um, uh, program planning and development and providing input into uh, those types of activities. So I'm going to start by introducing Ray Lay. Uh, Ray, I'm going to turn this over to you. All right, thank you. Thank you, Lord. Uh, <clears throat> good morning. Good morning. And my name is Ray Lay. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I am an Indiana Certified Recovery Specialist and also a Veterans Administration Peer Support Specialist. I am a formerly active duty United States Marine and I live with a dual diagnosis of schizoaffective disorder and polysubstance abuse issues. Um, I also spent seven years of my life in the Indiana State Prison, in Michigan City, Indiana, of which I have been out for approximately 29 years. And yesterday I just recently celebrated eight, eight years of, of sobriety. Clean and sober. Thank you. Clean and sober from uh, illegal drugs and alcohol. All of my drugs are legal. Come to me in the mailbox. Okay. And I take them, for lack of a better way to put it, religiously. Uh, so, yeah, share a little bit about what, what involvement you have in Indiana. Okay. Uh, as I stated, I am an Indiana Certified Recovery Specialist. And my specialty is with uh, persons with severe mental illness, persons who are homeless, because I also was homeless for a little over 10 years. I am now housed. I am, uh, as I stated, a formerly active duty United States Marine. And so I am housed through the Veterans Administration with the HUD VAS voucher. Uh, I have been housed going on. It's, I'll be starting my fifth year. Uh, July the 1st. I will also be starting my fifth year as an Indiana Certified Recovery Specialist starting July the 1st. I am in my third year as a Veterans Administration Peer Support Specialist. I am also a member of the Executive Committee of the Indiana Balance of State Continuum of Care uh, for just about two years. Um, I am also a trainer with the Indiana Housing Coalition Development Authority and in the collaboration with the Corporation for Supportive Housing, we do a, what's known as the Indiana Permanent Supportive Housing Institute. Uh, that is where my lived experience comes in at. Uh, and it, it covers quite a bit. I was in prison, and I still go back to prison. As I go back to prison now as to help train newly hired correctional officers with, for concerning mental health issues uh, through my, with my friends with NAMI, Indiana. And also, uh, I also help train police in the state of Indiana at the Indiana Law Enforcement Academy through my friends at the Department of Mental Health and Addiction. Uh, and also, I was recently awarded a grant from the state of Indiana to promote recovery <coughs> services and peer support services among uh, community mental health centers and also 
other nonprofits throughout the state of Indiana. I'm very <coughs> excited with that for the simple reason a lot of uh, organizations are reluctant to embrace the availability and uh, efficiency of the peer support specialist, but that's a okay because we're going to let them know just how great <coughs> it is. Thank you, Ray. And I have had, <clears throat> I've gotten to know everyone over the last um, couple of days, but I uh, um, obviously, since I'm based in Indiana, work on a regular basis with Ray, so I appreciate him uh, uh, being here with us. And Vicki, um, this is Vicki Kruger. Vicki, uh, if you can share just a little bit about yourself and the ways that you've been involved in advocating for people living with developmental disabilities. Okay. Thank you. Hi, my name is Vicki Kruger. Um, I, I've been a self-advocate most of my life, and um, last year I started a program with Stephanie and John called Supportive Housing Institute, and I've been going through all, to all the sessions, and this year is my, my first year of a national conference, and I'm, I'm helping people in Bloomington, Illinois, who can't, who can't speak for themselves to advocate for themselves. And um, it's going pretty good. And um, and I live on my own in an apartment setting with college students and people with intellectual and development, developmental disabilities. And I, and I give my voice and opinion if they need help. Vicki, if Vicki can hold on to yeah. the mic for just a second. There you go. I think John might have some more questions for you, Vicki. That'll be quick, Vicki, I promise. But, but actually, I want to make sure that this room knows this first. Um, uh, so actually, I'll ask Vicki, how was it, Vicki, to sit in a room for nine days to learn about supportive housing with other people? Oh, it was pretty good. Um, I, I learned a lot. I, you and Stephanie um, re reminded me on how I can speak up for myself and how to use my words correctly. And so I advised Vicki ahead of time that we would be using the word developmental disability. And we worked with Vicki to be tough enough in these public settings to use the word developmental disability. I've now used it five times in the last five minutes <laughs> at least. But Vicki, would you like for just a minute to tell the audience you're allowed, you're off the leash with regard to this right now, because this is the group that's supposed to be your advocates. What do you feel about when people refer to you as developmentally disabled? Do you want to tell them what they say? Because this is your chance. Well, I don't really like the word, but I have to hear it anyway. Um, I would like to be treated as an outsider, an individual person without a, a visible disability. Okay. And so the reason that I say that is two things. One, in the conference we did not yet really have a lot of discussion about develop, people with developmental disabilities for housing. And so uh, Vicki was uh, kind enough to come and join us. And in Illinois, we did run the first Supportive Housing Institute for developmental disabilities. Um, and um, we, Vicki knows that she's going to have to help to promote that. At the same time, she wants people with developmental disabilities um, to know that that's the one disability that we haven't decided should have their own apartment. And we don't know why, and we don't know why we have 24-hour staff to protect you from your roommates in that setting, but that's the one population that we don't have it for. And so you're our first national self-advocate to speak on that, which actually you can give her a hand right now for that. <laughs> But as you go back to your states, I want you to relook at the number of people with developmental disabilities who 
it seems to be okay to put them in a place with seven other roommates, a kitchen, and everybody's eating fish sticks. Um, that they should have their own apartment and be able to make those choices. And Vicki wants to be able to, and is currently living, but wants to be able to have even more choices and to have those. And so they're kind of the forgotten disability in which CSH is going to move towards next. And we appreciate the staff who come from Mark First uh, in Bloomington for that. And Vicki, thank you. Okay? Thank you. And this is her first time to Chicago. <laughs> Sorry, I'm I'm lost my <laughs> There you go. Thank you. Great. So uh, Dorothy Edwards is joining us, and we're very excited. And she's going to sh certainly share a lot more about herself. But she serves on CSH's uh, national board of directors. So thank you, Dorothy, for being here. Thank you, Lori. Hi, everybody. I'm Dorothy Edwards. And first off, I'm going to say what an honor it is to be sitting up here with such fabulous people, um, people who make a difference in our in our society, and. It's just, it's just awesome to be a part of that. Um, I am a graduate from the Los Angeles, uh, CSH Los Angeles uh, Speak Up, Speak Up Community Advocates Program. Um, in that program, I was taught how to speak publicly, how to consolidate my story, how to make an impact, and how to get people's attention with the first 10 to 15 seconds, because if you don't get it by then, then you lose them. And they taught us like little stuff like that. But most of all, they taught us to be able to express our hearts and our true feelings and our sufferings and, our, and our, also our, our wins. And today, I am a total winner. And I owe it all to CSH because uh, the advocacy program, it just taught me how to get out of my house and how to be a, a voice for those who can't speak for themselves. And, and so I'm also in recovery. I have 24 months clean and sober. And I have, um, I see you. Thank you. <laughs> um, um, this, when, I, when I was with the Speak Up program, we went to Sacramento and we lobbied bills on foster care and reentry. And we, uh, we made a big impact up there. And I'm talking to senators, and they did it again this year, and they took it to a whole new level, the movie advocates, and, and they're all my friends, and it's just awesome to see someone following something that I just did, and they're taking it to the next level, and it's getting bigger and more powerful, and I think that's really awesome, and I'd like to give a shout out to them. Um, I... Uh, I also am a uh, resident of permanent supportive housing. I live in a scattered site. I am getting nervous, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> I live in scattered site housing. I, um, I am a big part of my community. I sit on the city of Pasadena partnership for ending homelessness. I just recently in January started working for Housing Works Los Angeles as a peer advocate. Case management, case manager for the uh, mobile integrated uh, outreach team. Uh, it's it's awesome because I'm I'm on the board and I'm doing things up here, but then I'm down here hitting when my boots are hitting the ground, you know, and and it's just it, there's no limit in between That's what right. I can do, and I feel very empowered and very empowered by all of this. I speak at USC to. Uh, <coughs> Uh, master social work classes. Um, I do trainings at UHHP for case management institutes. I have spoken at the Conrad and Hilton Foundation several times, and that's my friend right there, Bill, <laughs> and the United Way. And um, it's 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 nice to be able to come from a background, a, such a sordid background as I've had, you know, with the drugs and institutions and, and and homelessness and just uh, to be so lost and to be found and be something powerful at it and I just want to say it's an honor to be here. Thank, Thank you. you. It's an honor to have you here.
Richard Rowe is joining us from Chicago, and uh, Richard uh, it serves on the continuum of care and has a variety of roles, both uh, through his employment as well as his work with the continuum. Um, so thank you, Richard. Good morning. Um, as she said, my name is Richard Rowe, and I am a person with lived experience. Currently, I work for Harlan Health Outreach uh, as a supervisor of community health workers. Now, prior to that, I worked for a Safe Haven Foundation as a case manager. And prior to that, I worked as a case aide. And prior to that, um, Haymarket as a detox specialist. Prior to that, I was incarcerated. And in and I came out and I went to uh, supportive housing and that's where it started for me. It afforded me an opportunity to get involved in everything that I'm involved in now. Uh, what I currently, I, I come from, well, I'm representing Chicago's lived experience commission. We have, which is part of our Chicago's continuum. It's one of the, I like to think of it like a three legged stool, our continuum service providers, government, and people with lived experience. So we are a major part in, in our uh, homeless um, system. Uh, I sit on the interim board of directors, <coughs> also on the executive board of that, I mean the executive committee of that board. I sit on the executive board of the lived experience commission. I also sit on another board for the affordable housing, there is an, an affordable <coughs> housing uh, agency, it's called Bickerdike, and what they do, they're a developer, I'm on their board as well. So there's a lot of opportunities in Chicago, um, I like to think that Chicago has the premier uh, or the epic center of people with lived experience because Chicago does find value and they've shown it and they show it daily. Um, uh, without our supportive housing, I don't know where I would be because that right there was the key for me. That, that allowed me to find employment and that was key because um, I do have uh, other issues. You know, I made a lot of un unwise choices and that led me to my incarceration. But while I was there, it gave me a chance to sit back and think, what am I going to do going forward? And when I went in, there was no, at least I was not a, uh, familiar with anything about supportive housing. So I was fortunate when I did come home, there was uh, supportive housing to help me. I got a case manager. They allowed me, they afforded, I mean, afforded me the opportunity to connect with all type of services. And from there, I went to um, subsidized housing. From there, uh, of course, with the employment, that afforded me the opportunity to purchase my own home, which I am now a homeowner. Awesome. And, but it started with supportive housing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I, I'm hoping that we'll get to talk about some of the supportive housing and the need of, and also transitioning out of uh, supportive housing. Uh, lastly, I'll leave you with this. The last day of my uh, drinking and drugging and criminal behavior was uh, March 23rd, 1996. Amen. Thank you, Richard. So, as you, um, so one of the things I'd like to highlight is uh, thinking about how you've each had a role in influencing, um, and going a little bit off script here, but influencing supportive housing. And uh, I just, um, or influencing policy related to supportive housing and, and um, both in terms of how it's developed and also funding and support for it. And, um, and I'm going to, um, uh, just remind Ray because um, this is the role that he's played in terms of his work. Like I'm, this is from my perspective as a staff of uh, the the COC at, at the, with the Balanced Estate and working really closely with the 
Indiana Housing and Community Development Authority right after um, when I first met Ray and he was uh, involved in, um, in some efforts, joint efforts that we had with our state NAMI um, to try and uh, have people with lived experience more involved in our work with supportive housing. And we convened a, a group of folks and you've heard Stephanie Seidman and John Fallon's name mentioned, they were um, uh, uh, really key in pulling uh, folks together. And from that, um, became an, there was an opportunity for uh, more uh, tenants of supportive housing to be involved as NAMI members and um, to become part of their um, uh, 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 speaking uh, groups and to educate more around uh, people uh, living with a mental illness and also talking about how important supportive housing is. And so my, um, I'm, I'm wearing a, a little bit of a hat of um, pretending like I work for government. And one of the things that I think uh, was really helpful from our perspective, um, CSH and IHCDA, as we learned more from Ray and, um, and other folks that were in, involved in those early discussions, is th these light bulbs kept going off. So first it was learning about the peer recovery specialist program and starting to think about how can we better integrate that with supportive housing. And then, um, and then so that work has started. And we, uh, as Ray mentioned, he's actually training with us at our Permit Supportive Housing Institute. But he connected to not, uh, organizations in our state who had never um, talked before. And that was um, uh, CSH and the training center um, that actually trains the certified recovery specialist. And so then we started meeting. And um, now we're talking about how do we uh, integrate housing training into the peer recovery um, uh, I'm sorry, the Certified Recovery Specialist Training. So just to give you an idea of, of the way that it's really, his involvement and others has really helped us in Indiana as we uh, think about supportive housing and as we build policy. And the other um, uh, program that I want to mention is, um, again, uh, something that we hadn't really uh, talked about is, or hadn't, we didn't know about, was uh, the MICM program. Uh, and I'll let Ray explain what that is, and how we just learned that there was this whole, um, this entire like set of resources and support for uh, veterans that we weren't aware of before. And um, now we're beginning to look at how we can collaborate with the VA and with MICM providers to help people live in independent housing. So that's just a couple of examples, and in. Um, I'll give uh, Ray, obviously, a couple minutes to talk. I'm only going to intervene as the acronym, please. Oh, sorry. Make sure. Yeah. Uh, uh, MICM is well, that's the what I was gonna... mental... Go ahead. What's the, what's okay. the actually stands for? But it is the VA's version of ACT. Exactly. Community yeah. Treatment. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, and, and one more. Is there another acronym, which would be the National Alliance for Mental Illness, is NAMI, uh, which is a national organization, and there's statewide yeah. organizations, which is where uh, our, we work. Our, um, uh, our, and our NAMI Indiana policy director is here, and also our NAMI state director is here. And I'm going to give a good shout out to him <laughs> for what it's worth. But anyway, uh, yes, I am a Veterans Administration peer support specialist. Uh, and I do work with, I engage veterans with the Mickham team and from Rattlebush VA Medical Center in Indianapolis, Indiana. There is a Mickham team at every medical center in the, in the country. Mickham st stands for the Mental Health Intensive Case Management. It is an off-branch acronym. But we, are, we only engage veterans with severe mental illnesses. Uh, schizophrenia, schizoaffective, Bipolar disorder and schizoaffective, I mean, and uh, post traumatic stress disorder. I get that, get that opportunity because I am one. I live with schizoaffective disorder. Um, I have been stable for approximately 10 years. 
Uh, my medication is very, very nice. I have had the opportunity to become engaged with a outstanding provider uh, for the sake of HIPAA. I'm not going to mention his name, but I will state that he is one of the few in the country that is a psychiatrist, psychologist, and a doctor of psychopharmacology. <clears throat> uh, he has also helped, helped me and to, I'm also six and a half years cigarette free. That is a great big accomplishment and it's one that I fight every day. And right along with Richard, I'm also, part of my certification is I am a community, community health worker. I work with others. Uh, to help them to try to uh, sideline the tobacco addiction. Uh, but with the Mickham team, we actually go to veterans' homes. We make sure that they are housed, housed correctly to, to their satisfaction, not to ours. Um, and the same with their medications. Uh, we are, the team cons is, consists of uh, three licensed clinical social workers, a psychiatric nurse, a regular RN, and a psychiatrist, and moi. <laughs> and so I enjoy it. When I first uh, joined them approximately a year ago, uh, we had a caseload of approximately 50. We have since had quite a, quite a successful outcome. Uh, we are down to approximately 30 now because they have discharged. Uh, they feel uh, good enough to live in the community on their own without the services of Mickle. And it makes us feel good. You can bet we are filling our Cheerios. <laughs> okay. Uh, but uh, I thank you and I, I hope that you get that opportunity to engage with a Mickle team in your area. Thank you, Ray. And uh, I'm going to pass the mic down and just ask if, um, Vicki, if you can share um, some of the uh, issues that you've talked about when you've been uh, uh, meeting with uh, folk, with people in Springfield. That would be great. And I'm going to remind you of who you met, remember? You just left now, but... Okay. <coughs> we, when, when I went to Springfield last year, with Stephanie Simon and John Fallon, um, I did learn a lot that that sometimes it's okay, that sometimes it is necessary to use the word developmental disabled and mental retardation and um, to, to get the point across about certain issues with people. And um, I, I also learned how to be a better person to speak up for myself. Okay, what about, can I, Vicki, who was it that you, who was it that you, who's the boss of developmental disabilities that you met, the division, remember, Kevin? Kevin Casey, um, I've known him since 1974 when I was four years old, and uh, he, he, I went to the Mark first kindergarten, preschool, and um, I've known him ever since, but unfortunately he had he had another job, so he had to move on, so he wasn't be, wasn't able to be here today the, at this conference, but he is still in the, the United States. And, and so I'll just, Great. I'll just point out that if you don't think it's important for your consumers to speak up in government, if the head of the Division of Developmental Disabilities has known you since four, <laughs> age four, you're able to call him up directly and talk with him. And now Vicki spoke with him quite eloquently about her wants and her needs. And so relationships, we only usually think about people's relationships in emergency settings. We don't think about the relationships that precede that. Mm -hmm. And Vicki demonstrated and pushes this now on a regular basis. That's great. That's awesome. Thank you, Vicki. You're welcome. Uh, Dorothy. 
So just to speak a little um, to some, just some examples of, um, of your involvement in, uh, in advocating and where you've seen and experienced some impact with, with the work that you've been doing. Um, I just I wanted to share with everybody an, an experience I had yesterday. Mm. I was standing right out front of uh, the hotel here, and there was a girl walking down the street with a, a camouflage jacket and a hoodie and two roller bags and one of those push carts. And across the street is a home furnishing place. And she was walking through, and she's looking through the windows at all the furniture. and. I was standing there and I was taken aback by it because I remember when I was out there and people used to give me money and then I'd think, oh, they're going home. I'm just like they are. Why can't I have a house? Why can't I have a home? And I went over and I engaged with her for a minute, but she was, at first she was very skittish and, and I related to that. But um, it's, it brought back to life in my mind why I'm really here and what I'm struggling for and what my goals are. Because that was me. That was me, except in a much colder climate, but that was me. And so it's things like that I recognize every single day. And I, because of my lived experiences, I can um, look for solutions, look for ways that I can reach out and do something better. I'm currently involved with harm reduction, social model, housing, um, at, at Housing Works Los Angeles where I work. And um, we're doing a lease up right now for, uh, um, through Works in Solari, and it's a, uh, for vets and for uh, developmentally disabled and for substance abuse and persons of, uh, just chronically homeless. Also, I want to say that, um, my uh, mentor, Molly Laurie from Los Angeles Housing Works, she um, pointed out that there was a shooting of a, of a homeless man in Venice Beach, and I get really upset about this. But the way that the media stigmatizes it is that it was a homeless, homeless. it was a transient, it was so dehumanizing. So I actually am, uh, I'm wanting to change the language of homelessness, and that's a big part of what I do. <laughs> that's really, that's great, and thank you for sharing that, because I, I think that is another way for us to think about how, how why it's so important to have people with lived experience in, involved in the, um, in the work that we do, actively. <laughs> yep. sure. Thank you. I like. I would like to just add uh, right along with that. Would like what Vicky was talking about. Uh, persons with lived experience. We had the honor of going to our state house in Indiana, right along with Nami, Nami, Indiana, and we actually were able to get a very important bill passed. It's a, a bill that where the police would have to have kind of like a clearing house before they can actually take someone to jail because the biggest provider of mental health services in the state of Indiana is the Indiana Department of Corrections. And so, I mean, and then you turn around, and now NAMI Indiana is, is partially helping to house them, service them, so on and so forth. So maybe if they could get stopped before it started, it could be better off. Thank you. Richard. Uh, you know, as I was listening, you know, there's a there's a a uh, board that I'm on. It's for Next Steps, and it was founded by a friend of mine, uh, Fred Freeman. And the, their statement, their slogan is, uh, "No decisions about us without us." Amen. And he wears this T-shirt. I I almost wore my T-shirt today, Amen. and I thought not. I, um, and it, it says, I'm one of those people, you know. Yeah. So, so just put in a face to this. 
like you were speaking about the stigmatisms, you know, this is something that we're constantly advocating and fighting against to try to reshape and, and that that thought, you know, and and reframe that the, the framework for the, these conversations. Um, I'm grateful and I'm fortunate that here in Chicago, I'm afforded the opportunity to be at those tables, you know. Um, the interim board of directors, which is the governing body for our continuum, as I said earlier, they find value there. And, and in everything they do, um, not always, uh, we're, we're not perfect. Um, however, we do have opportunities. I'm speaking of people with lived experience. We do have an opportunity for our input because if you're, if you're going to put together this complex or decide on how these monies should be spent to end homelessness, why not have someone there who's actually experiencing it or has experienced it to tell you, hey, look, this is what's happening, you know. Um, like before, I mentioned that I, I was formerly incarcerated. That was a problem with supportive housing not for support of housing, but in order for me to get an apartment. You know, there's these different criterias. And I'm sure this is in other, other states right. as well. Right. So with the systems integrations, you know, often, you know, I, I know here in Chicago, if it wasn't for the uh, people with lived experience, I don't think it ever would have come up. You know, maybe, maybe there was a provider who may have, you know. But we were at the table to push that issue, and we're still speaking on that now, because these entities that are, everybody's, I mean, that, that are doing this work, they need to talk to each other. And that's where the value is with, uh, from people with lived experience, the so people who are actually, as you said, the boots on the ground. Boots you know, on the ground, basically. You know. So there, there's, there's so many different things, but let me, let me just uh, say this. I'm a certified drug and alcohol counselor. I'm a national certified recovery specialist. Uh, I'm a MISA specialist, that's mental illness and substance abuse. Um, uh, I also, I'm also a recovery coach. I'm the co-chair of our Continuum's uh, membership committee. So and because of the HEART Act, this particular year, we're opening it up. We're trying to expand it to go beyond HUD recipients. And all of this is because of that supportive housing, Bingo. that opportunity mm -hmm. yeah. that, to get there to that table. And, and, not to, and, and I'm a strong advocate of, about having uh, us at the tables, but in a meaningful, relevant role. Mm -hmm. Not just to say, you know, as a token, to say, yeah, we have them. No, listen, you know, or ask us a question. So I will digress no, no, and hopefully, you, you know, right let you guys yeah. ask us some questions, but yeah. yeah. Great, thank you. And so I'm gonna ask you one, uh, one more question and then we're going to uh, open it up for dialogue with the audience. Um, as you think about, if you were giving advice, uh, um, and you are giving advice. <laughs> so uh, as you give advice to um, those in the audience who are interested in, in, in having um, people with lived experience participate, as Richard said, in a meaningful way, um, what, what would your advice be or what is your advice uh, to help um, uh, set that up and to invite people in? And what's been, I think, it would be helpful to know what's been important to you in um, being successful in doing that yourself. <clears throat> well, I would say, uh, like as it stated, lived experience. Uh, involve us, as, as, as Richard Shirt says, no decision about us without us. That's that's kind of like it in a nutshell. Um, like, when I became involved with NAMI, this little lady, she walked up to me and she said, hey, she didn't know me from Adam. She said, she asked me, how would you like to go to prison? And 
talked with a newly hired correction officer. She didn't know I had ever been in prison. <laughs> but it mean, but she had to, she, for some strange reason, she felt like asking me. And I told her then that I had been in prison. And I have been going back to prisons since then. Uh, and it also became, uh, I, I did not have any shame of the fact that I live with a severe mental illness and substance abuse issues. I'm formerly homeless. And I realized how they're all intertwined. And so uh, from that initial meeting, I realized, man, I got something here. This is a way to give back. But not only give back, for me to get a whole lot more. And when I say get, I'm talking about get as far as my own personal recovery is concerned. Okay. Uh, and if you can find someone that can kind of like fit that glove, please, please accept that person. Accept that person for what they are, all right? I mean, where they are. For the simple reason, I guarantee you it's going to enrich you and them. Yeah, I have no idea what that is. Before, Vicki, before you say, I want to just kind of give you a little prompt. So I don't want you to say John and Stephanie helped you to learn to get to the spot. <laughs> They've heard that. Um, you have some other people at Mark First who've been helping you to think through and who gave you opportunities before that. You want to talk about how you became a self-advocate even before the Institute and why they picked you to go to the Institute and not other people? I think you had a few people who helped you. Um, I started being an advocate uh, two to three years ago, and her name's Laura Furlong. And from Mark Furt, and she asked me to speak up, speak out um, on on different issues, and and then I I went from there to Springfield, and um, I've been doing that ever since because she thinks I'm a strong person and a strong speaker. And do you have anyone here who helped you out to make sure you did okay here? Yes, yes. Her name is. Jennifer Randall, she's right there in the black sweater <laughs> and making hay, which is right by the door. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Oh, what was I saying? <laughs> I'm sorry. My heart's just no. no, no. Just... <laughs> I, I, I should have repeated. Uh, uh, just as you're, if you're giving advice to. Um, Folks in the audience, organizations, um, nonprofits, or uh, government agencies, and if they're interested in in bringing people um, into the conversation who have lived experience, what what are your recommendations about how to do that, and what kind of support people might need? Um, I, I I really want to express the importance of the continuum of care. Mm -hmm. Um, especially in the mental health system. Mm -hmm. I also have mental health issues. Um, and I was introduced into the, um, the, the harm reduction um, social model mm -hmm. and continue of care, continuum of care services. And um, they just greatly, greatly helped me come out of my shell and helped me heal. And that was the biggest part of my uh, relief from my drug addiction and my substance abuse was that freedom of, of self and that bondage of self. So I just want to yeah. basically really stress the importance of that. Yeah. Um, I just think that uh, my, my opinion is, um, like I always say, never look down on anybody unless you're helping them up. And mm -hmm. um, always you know, look people in the eye because they are not above you and they are not below you. But they're equal with you. Um, it doesn't matter who they are, what they are, where they've been, where they're going. And that's the most powerful thing you could do is just to be like completely level with somebody else. And that's where I'm at. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Richard. Well, I would say number one, government, make it a requirement. Yeah. It, you know, and <laughs> for 
sure. And for any organizations, uh, be courageous like my organization. Not saying that other organizations don't, but I'm not aware of many who actually wrote in the job description for my position that a requirement was to have lived experience. That's huge. Um, employment, <laughs> can't say enough about that. It, without the employment, we can't really advance. And these barriers that we have, and I'll, I'll get to, <laughs> but these barriers, um, for someone with SSDI or on SSDI, and they want to work, they can only make so much, and then it affects them. So that's something that, as a system, we, we do need to um, address. Um, I would say have empathy, not sympathy. Um, patience, uh, along with the acceptance, you'll begin to have some understanding, because you may not be used to the way we convey ourselves or the way we communicate, and you may lose patience for that. So, and if you're, if you really are trying and you don't know, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You can contact us. <laughs> I know here in Chicago, I think that we have a great model and I will leave my information, John or CSH, they, they know how to reach me. And we are willing to come out and help educate, train, um, you know, plug for lived experience, our lived experience commission. Um, but that, that's just it. It's just doing it, you know, just do it, you know. Good advice. <laughs> so, can, um, can I just add yeah. to, I will add, you can send that down that way and then they don't get towards <laughs> that way. Um, that you heard Richard say, how many boards are you on? <laughs> Four. And yesterday he couldn't meet with us because he had to get to another board meeting. And so um, I just want to say, if you don't have people with lived experiences on your board, and if you're working with children, children can be on a board. Adolescents can be on the board. If your uh, board restricts, you know, based on criminal history and you're serving criminal history, that's criminal of you. Um, you know, you need to be able to include Everyone and everyone will step up if given that opportunity. And I just, I can't say that enough, and these folks are such wonderful examples, and I'm turning it back to you, and I'm going to stand up, right, and go yeah, over and, out there. Yeah, well, and what I was, I also just want to add one thing to what you said, and that's about um, reimbursement and pay. So as you create job opportunities, um, you know, that's obviously one vehicle. Stipends are another, helping with transportation. The rest, you know, those of us who are, uh, doing this work, um, so to speak, uh, um, and are getting paid to be at the continuum meeting. Like we should, tr we should treat um, people with lived experience um, the same way that if their involvement and um, uh, and roles should be compensated for to the extent that's possible. Yeah, go ahead, Richard. Um, just to piggyback, yeah. something to add to that. That is very important because oftentimes, you know. We're not paid professionals. The providers and government, they're paid to do what they do. Mm -hmm. And here in Chicago, uh, the, the majority of the, well, I, I may be the only one that has a full-time job. Um, so there, the stipends are very important in terms of transportation to, to get to and from. But I would, I would just throw this out there to think about how you deliver that or how that stipend is provided to the uh, person with lived experience. Because again, if, it's a, if there is a individual who is on SNAPs receiving you know, uh, TANF yeah. food stamps, or if they are getting SSI or uh, SSDI, that income could affect them. Right. So just to think about how you, the options, providing options in terms, it could be a gift card or whatever, just think about that, yeah. how it and, would affect Good them. point. And, and actually, I want to make sure, because I've been in a meeting with Rayleigh where I aired. You want to say something, Rayleigh, about getting paid and who's paying you and, and, and why you do this and that, a shout out to that employer? 
CSH uh, is one. <laughs> no, 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 no. I meant, isn't, isn't the VA? The VA. Yes. Because the VA has really been a leader in this area. Yes, the VA, uh, VA pay. Oh, okay. The VA does pay, pay uh, peer support specialists better than anyone else in the country. Uh, but me, myself, I am a volunteer of VA peer support specialist. But I do receive stipends. Uh, and also, I am, I am recently funded by the state of Indiana right. from a right. special grant, uh, which is uh, attached with the uh, mental health community block. Uh, yeah. uh, community. community mental health uh, block, block, grant. block grant, yeah. yes. Uh, and, but first and foremost, on my behalf, my major issue is to try, not issue, but passion, is to try to work with as many people as I possibly can uh, on issues that I, that, that I can help them with and what I cannot help them with, try to help them to get to someone who can help them with it. Uh, and with that, hey. I'm gonna say, just ask you to say one thing before we turn over to the audience, but why you decided to volunteer, because I've been, and I know this happens with every one of you, that um, because of the talent that is here on this panel, that anytime I'm in a room with Ray, there are five job offers. So, <laughs> what, <laughs> what? She's right, she's right. I get job offers uh, quite a bit. Yeah. Um, so and I turn them down because I have a job. My job is to take care of me. I live with a severe mental illness, schizoaffective disorder. For those of you who do not know what schizoaffective disorder is, it is schizophrenia mixed with the mood disorder. My mood disorder is bipolar disorder. Plus, I have to watch myself very, very careful. Uh, and I have to be very vigilant on me. And I spend a lot of time away from people. Not because I do not like people, but it can be kind of like taxing. So, hey, I've learned how to live with me. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like a hard job to try to like live with me with other people too. <laughs> well, so I'm going to add one more thing, because, you know, we may never get to you guys, which is, which is that I really want you to understand one thing, is that while you four are tremendous, I worked with, you know, hundreds of people who had more than a hundred arrests. And I just kept, put, we had a rule that nobody got to speak to the media more than once because there were lots of people coming to us and we just kept switching. And there never was a bad spokesperson with lived experience to say, because they were the expert on themselves. And I can't tell you, don't have your poster child. Right. Everyone, it's a systemic problem, so involve everyone in the system in every part because there is no decisions about us, without, without us. us. Yeah.